Sometimes, um, you know, well, back in the ancient world, in the time of the Buddha, they had chariots and uh, pulled by horses, and so they used uh, that as analogy. And probably there are fewer parts than cars, so it's maybe easier to use as analogies. And um, and uh, so I'll borrow from that. It won't be strictly the ancient analogy. But uh, you have a chariot with two horses. And the two horses are pulling it along. And the um, chariot has two wheels. And if the wheels turn well, and if the brakes are off the wheels, then the chariot rolls nicely. If the chariot has two horses that are kind of of equal strength and ability, it'll pull them, pull the chariot straight. But if one horse is stronger than the other or working harder than the other, then the tendency is to veer the chariot a little bit in one direction or the other direction. So in this way, um, we have our chariot, of pra- which is we can call the practice we have, and the practice moves along smoothly, well, if the wheels can turn nicely. So the hub has to be true. Uh, if there's a, a kink in the hub and the hub has a little dent in or something and not smooth, then uh, the wheel's going to be wobbly. And to have a smooth hub is uh, our ethics, our morality, the goodness that we live in, the integrity we have. And without a certain degree of morality, the, the wheel is going to be kind of wonky. And the more unethical we are, the more wonky that wheel is going to go. And at some point, the chariot's not going to even go at all because of how the chariot, the wheels are not working. But then there can be the brakes on the, on the wheels, and if the brakes are on, then it's going to be hard to get those horses to pull. They might, they might be able to s- scrape along the ground with the wheels if it's locked in. And uh, the brakes to the practice are the hindrances. And uh, things like greed, hate, and delusion, but uh, uh, sensual desire, aversion, restlessness and agitation, sloth and torpor and doubt. That um, there's all these forces that we have, preoccupations, things we get caught up in. And if we're too caught up in these forces, with these preoccupations, then there the won't, the, you know, the, from one sense, there won't be any chariot at all. But if you have a chariot, you're trying to make it to go, and, and, uh, but you're really, op- really preoccupied with other things, it's like having the brakes on, and it won't roll. But once the 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 um, the you know the hub is moving smoothly, so there's no resistance, no wonkiness in it. And once the brakes are off, then uh, really good, true wheels of a chariot will just roll kind of freely and nicely, and and um, and they're available to roll. They're ready to they're ready to roll. And uh, all it needs is something that pulls them along and moves them. So if we have an ethical life, live with integrity, if we're able to do the purification work, the deep work, it's not easy, to find out how to kind of free ourselves from our preoccupations, especially the strong ones, those that are powered by greed, hate, and delusion, those, you know, involving greed, you know, the hindrances, then, um, then what happens is that we're available for the practice. The practice is a chariot, and the, the chariot is available to roll. And uh, and getting into this place where we're available to roll, we're available to be moved, to be unfold, to to go, be pulled by the horses, um, is a wonderful state to be in. And it, it should be remembered that we have to make ourselves available for the practice to pull us. It isn't so much that we have to do the practice, we do it certainly to some degree, but it's also our availability to roll along, to smoothly and be pulled along by the horses. And the two horses, one of them is samatha, uh, not samadhi, it's almost, a, it's almost treated as synonyms, but samatha. And, um, and then uh, the same first four letters, sama, S-A-M-A, but then it's T-H-A, samatha. And the other is um, vipassana. 
And, um, and Vipassana, so these two are the horses that pull along the chariot, Samatha and Vipassana. Samatha is usually translated as tranquility, uh, and it refers to a kind of a whole uh, class of, whole kind of category of states of mind and practices that bring tranquility, calmness, sometimes translated as serenity. My favorite translation is calm abiding. Calm abiding. And um, I like this word abiding, kind of resting or just being. And calm abiding. So, so, the, so cultivating calm abiding. Vipassana is usually translated into English as uh, insight. That's the name of IMC. The insight, the you know, the Vipassana Meditation Center, the Insight Meditation Center. But it also sometimes is uh, uh, translated as clear seeing because the pasana means to see. And uh, 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 sometimes I like kind of a loose translation and, uh, and think of it as clarity. And so with these two, samatha vipassana, one is, is, drink, is uh, calm abiding and clarity. And we're cultivating both. Those are the practices that we're cultivating and developing. And as we bring along these forces and develop greater and greater kind of this tranquility and greater clarity, then that uh, is what pulls along. That's onward leading for the chariot, moves the chariot along smoothly. And um, uh, in some ways, mindfulness is the is the, um, what's it called, the pole, that uh, the chariot pole that that they have between the two horses that come up from the, ch- the uh, chariot? Anybody know what the book? Not the yoke. The yoke goes over between the horses, but the pole that goes from the chariot to the yoke. The chariot pole? <laughs> and uh, that's the mindfulness. Mindfulness is what connects us to these states. Mindfulness is what uh, connects us for ourselves to the practice, to the experience. Mindfulness is the means by which the, f- the momentum of tranquility and insight uh, can, can pull us along. We have to be present, we have to be aware, we have to be connected. Partly mindfulness is the connection, making that connection. And um, some people say that uh, uh, faith is the harness that you hold onto the horses. So. The harness doesn't move things along. You not you don't get pulled by the harness, but the harness the, the the harness is very important for guiding the horses and getting them to go just the right way. And so I'm not sure quite how that connects to faith, but maybe you can figure it out for yourself. Um, and um, so um, and so part of the work of practice is the purification work. And a lot of what we're doing as we do this kind of practice is in fact purification. If you don't like that language, which I used to not like, purification also means uh, uh, um, resolving the issues that, unresolved issues in our life that kind of make things hard for the chariot to go. So sometimes the, the hub of the wheel needs to be smoothed out, sometimes the brakes need to be uh, fixed and released, they're locked in. Uh, sometimes we have to do something that, that we need to put in springs in the chariot to go smoothly. Uh, sometimes we need to go out and get out of the chariot. And uh, we have to kind of smooth the road a little bit, fill potholes that are too deep or something. So there's all this work that has to be done that I put on the category of purification. And um, uh, in both these, as, as, as uh, samatha develops, as vipassana develops, uh, we inevitably run into a lot of the, these things that have to be worked out, smoothed out, shed, resolved, healed, developed, all these things that fit in the category of purification. Um, both samatha and vipassana uh, share uh, with them uh, the need for concentration. Concentration is the primary thing that brings us tranquility and uh, but concentration also is what allows for vipassana. Without concentration, there's no vipassana, the insight. And so um, uh, cultivating concentration is, um, or samadhi, 
is part of the game here. And a, and a kind of one way of talking about it is to maybe talk about how someone who comes to meditation for the first time, I don't know if anybody of you are this, I doubt any of you are that situation today. To, we're so quiet, it's so quiet in here. But uh, if someone had never meditated before and they just showed up here this morning and said, I'm just going to try this out. Uh, a kind of a relatively typical mind uh, that is, uh, hasn't practiced at all is a mind that's preoccupied with a lot of things and uh, might have anxiety that driving the forces of the mind. The mind is preoccupied by things, is interested in things. And the, the untrained mind is often a mind that jumps around and caught up in ideas and thoughts and preoccupations. And coming to a new place like this, with that kind of mind, every sound that comes in is like, oh, what's that? What's that? You know, like the floor creaks or the door opens or someone moves next to you. Or every sound, like part of the people, especially if there's anxiety, everything is so important. If there's a lot of desire, every, you know, little sound around might, is that a good one? Or whatever the, the one is, a person or lunch or whatever. Um, you know, the mind is you know, searching, looking, wanting, trying to be safe. So, you know, it's very concerned about the outer, might be very concerned about the outer, you know, world and what is, what's going on. As the mind, so that's a busy mind, as the mind settles down, gets calmer, gets more quiet, uh, it no longer is jumping around so much or following, chasing the things around us, the world around us. And the, the world of sounds, the exterior world, begins to settle away. It's still there, but it's not so much interesting for us. We're not focused on it. We're not, the mind is not uh, no longer oriented to pay attention to the world around. And so that begins to recede uh, in a certain kind of way from our interest, recede from where the focus of attention is. Tendency is then to become more inward. As we become more inward, then some people, their mind is still jumping around, but maybe in a very different way, and it's jumping around in their own mind. Uh, their thoughts and ideas and feelings and judgments and commentary and stories and all these ideas. And if, those, if that's understood to be where we're going to work out our life, that's the place to solve everything. Um, and uh, then, of course, we're going to be interested in that. There also, if there's a tendency towards anxiety or a tendency towards a lot of greed and desire or a tendency towards ill will, aversion, there can be a prioritization of those kinds of concerns in the mind. And we think that that's what's important and that's what keeps us kind of, kind of yoked to those thoughts. This is important, it's really important. My anxiety is really important. It's like the most important thing in the world. I mean, I have to solve this, I have to fix this, I have to deal with it. And so whatever you're anxious about becomes very important. And it's wonderful how anxiety will just come along and just choose new things to be anxious about. You know, it can be never end, never ending. And uh, so, you know, solve one and look around for another good one. Same thing with, uh, with uh, aversion. That's what it's, that's what's about. That's what gets prioritized. That's what's important. That's where my identity is, what's important. And somehow I'm going to fix everything or take care of myself if I just blame everything or get angry at things. And so that gets prioritized. And of course, the things we're angry about then, the thoughts, ideas are important. The mind goes there. And the same thing with desire. The, you know, desire is a little bit more uh, subtle, uh, tricky, because desires sometimes are nice. And so they can feel good. And so it can feel like, you know, why not? You know, but they're still, you know. So that's some people, that's kind of their thing. You know, everything's about getting my desires met. And so the thoughts, the concerns, and the fantasies about that uh, get the upper hand. And so the mind is still busy and active and moving a lot. It's a wonderful a little saying they say that's been said that um, uh, if you look into a moving river, fast moving river, you won't see your reflection. You have to, uh, if a, a, a river which is very, very slow and clear, or even better, a still pond, you, lake, you might see your reflection. So in the same way, if the mind is moving too much, 
moving and moving and moving, it's too much agitation to really see yourself well, to really see the depth of us and be connected here. So this is why we do a practice like concentration, like something as simple as mindfulness of breathing, focusing on the breathing. That's a fantastic place to cultivate both horses, mindfulness and concentration, mindfulness and tranquility and calm. Coming back and and be interested in the breath. Become more interested in the breathing than you are in all those fear-based concerns, desire-based concerns, uh, aversion-based concerns, doubt-based concerns that we have. And that's a training of the mind. That has a lot of purification. We have to work through a lot for some people to begin to work through enough of that and to have a new relationship to all that to no longer be wedded to it, no longer feel like this is what's important, this is what's going to do it for me. I know some people who may have to meditate for years before they kind of say, you know, they finally realize, you know something? I've been doing that way for a long time and it didn't get me anywhere. It was kind of nice to sit there and my body worked its kinks out and I could sit comfortably. But, uh, you know, really what I'm doing is just all this thinking and you know that was calmer at the end of the day so that was nice but you know after 10 years <laughs> I don't think that's the way so hopefully not 10 years but uh, so sooner or later we learn that's not the way that's not so interesting anymore so at some point what becomes interesting is cultivating samatha and vipassana cultivating samadhi really let's, let's go deeper here and so something like mindfulness of the breathing uh, allows us to shift where attention goes and begin exercising our capacity to choose where our attention goes and to shift it from where the default of thoughts and preoccupation to just staying with the breathing, for example. And why that is important is I like to think of fu- of uh, attention or our awareness is kind of like food. The Buddha called consciousness food. Um, but uh, I think of awareness as kind of like food, and where your awareness goes feeds something. Sometimes it feeds what you're paying attention to. So if we're, if we're focusing kind of in a, in a, in a kind of, if we're, you know, absorbed or if our attention is lost or preoccupied with fear, the fear is actually fed. If our, we're preoccupied with desires, desire, the desiring movement is fed. If we're preoccupied with anger, that's what's fed, that's what grows. We're trying to shift where the food goes. It's, it's such an amazingly precious resource we have to be aware It's like one of the most precious things, valuable things that you've been entrusted with. But no one told you you were. (laughs) But no one else was entrusted with your awareness. It wasn't, (laughs) you know, we can't hold someone else responsible for it. You know, know, unless it's the people who produce good TV shows. (laughs) We're going to trust them. But uh, the... um, but, you know, we have to, we're entrusted to be responsible for our awareness, what we do with it, where it goes, what we attend to, what we focus on. And we have some choice. And we want to focus on things which are wholesome, that are beneficial, that really nourish and feed us, feed something useful. So samatha and vipassana are useful things to feed. So if we focus the attention with the purpose of cultivating concentration and mindfulness, then we're cultivating something healthy. So what happens as people start to uh, continue able to do this, is just like the sounds around us when we meditate begin to recede from importance and we're not so focused on them. We're not you know, on eggshells listening to everything. So the same thing happens with our thinking, that our thoughts no longer become so interesting. They recede. They don't necessarily stop. They can sometimes, but I think it's more useful to think of they just recede more and more. They become thinner and lighter and less interesting. And uh, there might be some thoughts in the background which are not very interesting, 
um, but we're not interested in them. <laughs> so they just kind of do their thing in the back. And what's interesting where the focus goes, where the, this, this wonderful food can go, is, you know, to something wholesome. Mindfulness of breathing is considered to be one of the very wholesome things you can do. Provided that when you focus on the breath, you're not doing it with greed, anxiety, fear, or hostility. You know, you want to just be able to focus on it with an open, relaxed breath. You want to focus on it without any brakes on the wheels. You want to be able to focus on it, you know, in a, in a way that the road is, you know, you have good springs, so you roll along nicely. So the road is smooth. So, um, so as we get more focused, then what recedes, the second level of receding, is this, um, you know, all the thoughts, all the preoccupations and everything. To agree to which thinking is still useful, it's very simple thoughts about the practice. Very simple thoughts about what we're bringing our attention to. And at some point, the thinking becomes mostly just thoughts around the breathing. And they're also, you know, those, those simple, very simple uh, thoughts. It might be very simple thoughts where we give ourselves little instructions. We're back to basics. Just, just, let's just be with that in-breath. Let's be with that out-breath. Let's feel that breath fully. Let's kind of really s- kind of tune in to just that experience of, of pleasure or joy that comes with that breathing or expansion. So giving yourself that very simple rudimentary thoughts, giving yourself instructions to go, is a good thing to do when the alternative is worse. <laughs> And if the alternative is you're, you kind of, you know, you keep getting s- slipping into those other thoughts and ideas that, you know, don't not helpful, give yourself some very simple, relaxed, gentle instructions, thoughts. Stay there, there, dear. <laughs> Stay there. You can do it. And then as, as we get more focused and more settled, the calm abiding, we settle in, those kinds of th- thoughts aren't needed anymore. And it gets simpler and simpler. And then at some point, it becomes really easy to stay because we're abiding. It's a wonderful feeling of calm abiding. This idea of calm abiding for me is just so delicious. Calm abiding is when you're like so clearly here. Boy, you're here. Like, finally. (laughs) I'm here. I'm nowhere else. And I'm kind of like resting or the whole system, the body and mind, is unequivocal unequivocally here, present in this body, in this place, this time, so clearly here, and it's, it takes work to go anywhere else. <laughs> it's like going uphill to have the mind start thinking about other times, other places, other things. It just feels like this is like the bottom of the, of the bowl. You know, the ball, in the bowl, you know, you put a ball and a marble and a bowl, it's does all this you know, up and down and around and around and its momentum slows down and it comes down and finally the, the marble is calmly abiding at the bottom of the bowl. So it, it kind of, this thing of finally being here, this calm abiding. So this, that's when calm abiding begins, when we're really here. And there's clarity. And these two are the horses that go together. If you have too much calmness without the clarity, it's easy to fall asleep or get dull. If you have too much clarity without enough calm abiding, some people actually um, get a little bit too, uh, it it gives birth to whole other kinds of way of thinking or ruminating or, or excitement, certain goes on. But the idea is to have the two together, to have clarity, that's with calm abiding. And, um, and that combination allows you kind of, the waters become still and quiet, and you can see your reflection. You can start seeing what's really going on here in a much deeper way. The water is calm, and all the sediment has settled away. So now you can really see both yourself 
and you can see reality. We can start seeing what's actually happening here in a deeper and deeper way. And this is a great, wonderful thing. It's wonderful to have the sense of just, it's so good to feel like you're really here. There's no boredom. There's no feeling that something else needs to be done or I have to accomplish something. Nothing you have to do to prove yourself because you just, it feels so good to be here, settled. And it's so brilliant to be, have this clarity. The clarity of mind is, I think, is one of the best things going in the world, in the universe. The, to add this clarity. And the clarity, when it gets really good, one of the things that recedes, just like the sounds recede, then the thoughts recede, one of the things that recedes is what normally is your favorite topic. <laughs> the self disappears. The, the idea of, of there being, somehow the idea of me, myself, and mine, the thoughts about me, myself, and mine, and I'm doing something, I'm accomplishing something, I need, you know, me, what has to happen for me. It's kind of a brilliant thing to have this clarity, the, 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 sen- the kind of a sense of me, myself, and mine, the sense of there being a, a, a central I, I often use the word, the central, um, you know, control tower to it all, but a central clearinghouse that has to clear everything, and a central processing center for it all, central hub, a central um, tax collector. <laughs> I don't know what. But um, the, um, you know, the sense of this, this center falls away. And just clarity without that center of self. It's quite lovely. So, these two horses that we're cultivating. As we cultivate samatha and vipassana, calm abiding and clarity. Because calm abiding, the way I talked about it especially, it sounds like you're just there, stationary kind of, everything's still it can kind of feel, kind of the idea can be given that, oh, well then there's no horses that are pulling anything. And uh, maybe the horses disappear too. But, uh, but what happens is that um, uh, 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 samatha and vipassana, when they get strong, are onward leading. They will naturally unfold, they naturally move along. So, so they're the horses that keep pulling, they're the water that will flow downhill, they're, um, you know, it's the, uh, you know, it's the, I don't know if this is a good analogy, but it's the um, dandelion, you know, seeds, they get picked up by the wind and get blown gently along. Um, it's the wind that pulls, pushes the dandelion seeds, or it's the, you know the water that carries the leaf down the down the stream down the hill, or it's the you know the horses that pull the chariot. It's it's onward leading, and it's a one. And this is also a brilliant and wonderful thing to feel the kind of momentum, feel the growing, the unfolding that happens. That's not your doing. We're a, we make ourselves available. We put all the conditions in place. And this idea of being available, the brakes are off. The wheels are smooth. And then to feel this, you know, this, uh, this uh, kind of <coughs> wonderful momentum of deepening and opening and, and uh, clarifying and seeing that goes along in the practice. So, It's a great journey. It's a great thing to do to cultivate these things, to develop and work. And, and it's just really good to be on the path. It doesn't matter how long it takes. It doesn't matter how quickly it is. It just it doesn't matter how far along you are. It's just so good to have the opportunity in this lifetime to be the custodian, the caretaker of this wonderful thing that you've been entrusted to with. 
you've been entrusted with, I think, one of the most precious things in the universe, your awareness. Be the custodian of it. Care for it well. Don't let others dictate where your awareness goes. Don't let advertisement, don't let politicians, don't let the messages of society somehow become the default of where what you focus on, what you pay attention to, and what you think about. Become your own custodian of it. And, it's, and let be very careful that your attention goes to things that feeds and develops that which is best in you, that which is wholesome and beneficial, that which is good for you. So thank you for this day. And uh, as I keep saying, and um, we have the practice here at IMC that it's the people who practice here who care for the center. Everything that's all the caretaking for this building from from cleaning to buying, you know, toilet.